In our last webinar, we were speaking about what we see and sense our world of analog work is fading away for manual workers and service economies. And we were concentrating on the riders we see with a gig economy. And today we want to focus on the upskilled segment on the digital nomads. And we just, I just give you a bit of an introduction. If you check the internet on the numbers on data, you can see that there is a rise in digital nomads. At least that is what the quick and dirty statistics tell us. And it is focusing mainly on the US. So that is interesting for as an information you can see here. So it's millions of people. If you look on the definitions, you find definitions like this one at the Digital Nomad World website. They would say rather than a job title or a career, being a digital nomad is a lifestyle. And this is what most people are speaking about when they think of digital nomads. So it's about lifestyle. And there's a promise to continue your career or to make travel your full-time job as a digital nomad. And so it is about promises, a community on its own with many promises. Here you see the workplace Chiang Mai in Thailand, for example. This is what you find if you Google the topic. You find by this community that digital nomadism is tied to places and spaces promises of having a nice working environment. In our webinar, we want to focus a bit on different things. Uh, Beverly Thompson is speaking of the canaway in the coal mine, and she will explain this to us. I think that is an exciting expression to understand what we are looking at. She will speak about the biographical background of the digital nomads. And she will show us it's a highly selective group, uh, which is familiar to traveling. It, she will look on the features of this group. She will speak about nomadism, digital nomadism as part of a neoliberal doctrine, positivity, life coaches, and the promises of fluid modernity of some sort of snowball systems behind it. She will speak about visa regulation and social policies. So, and then on the relationship with the place of arrival, it is all about the coasts and hospitality. It's not about the culture, the people, the language, the food and the connection. And she will speak about the nomad organization and self-perception of this group. And I'm very happy to introduce you to our speakers today, which is of course, Mrs. Beverly Ewan Thompson at Siena College in New York. And she presents her book, Digital Nomads Living at the Margins, Remote Working Laptop Entrepreneurs in the Gig Economy. And we have Professor Daniel Cocaine. He develops his arguments on the basis of his work on the economic function and discursive practice of sharing in the digital on-demand economy. We have then Mrs. Margaret Walton Roberts. She's a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. I will be chairing and how will we do it? We are in good shape. Professor Thompson will speak for about 20 minutes about her seminal book, I would say. Uh, Professor Cocaine will comment for another 10 minutes. And then we have a 20 minute slot for question and answers and discussion. So questions, answers and discussions afterward. What are the social political implications of this form of labor organization? This is our focus here. It's not so much on the lifestyle, but it's rather on what does it mean for the changes in the world of work? And here I stop and I hand over to Beverly. Thank you for being with us. Hello, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see that then? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, so I just wanted to first start with the term digital nomad came from this book and the authors Makimoto and David Manners published this book in 1998. So this was at the dawn of the internet. And they were, this was more of a philosophy book, just talking about what potential the internet had to revolutionize people's lives. And so they had this quote, 
finding himself in a pleasant part of the world and enabled by technology to run his business from a hotel room or even a beach without being at the mercy of the latest crisis call. He can take time out to enjoy himself free from the dictates of a rigid travel schedule set by a zealous secretary or a demanding boss. So this is where the term comes from, and this is kind of the dream of how it starts. In 1998, which is pretty amazing. Let me just see how. And so these types of advertisements you start to see in 2014, and I would pinpoint that year as the beginning of when this lifestyle really starts to, and you can see the slides, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, really starts to develop on the social media and in the newspapers and stuff like that. And it's always this type of image. You see this young, white, good looking person on the beach with a laptop and a beer and a, a surfboard and stuff like that. And we can see these kinds of images here. And so these are the news stories that you see typically, and they're always very positive, very glamorous, people just really living in a high luxury lifestyle. They're in co-worker spaces with other people that look just like them. And so this is really how people start to learn about the lifestyle and really want to join this kind of lifestyle. And so I use these kinds of theoretical frameworks of uh, Bowman's liquid society, and I have a very strong neoliberal critique. Like all the newspaper articles are just positive on digital nomads. They're not critical at all, but I have a very kind of neoliberal critique of this type of lifestyle. And these are the chapters in my book. So I, I published the book in 2021, uh, but I started researching it in 2017. So it does uh, take place before the pandemic and then during the pandemic. I talk about the position of Western millennials in general in, in Western countries. And then um, I also have a really interesting chapter four, which is a critique of positive psychology. Positive psychology, of course, is a huge part of uh, entrepreneurial uh, ideology. And it's huge, huge in the digital nomad landscape. But what I uncover in this chapter is that positive psychology actually has a lot of conservative money that funds it. And you see these books being given out to corporations and stuff like that because it's it's extremely neoliberal. Uh, I talk about the communities that digital nomads seek um, and form based on other people just like them. And then talk about the marginalized identities of people who don't really can't really become digital nomads, even though digital nomads always sell the lifestyle of anyone can do this. And so in previous lectures in this series, we've talked about migration and refugees and folks that are really leaving their home countries because of very serious negative issues, uh, war, political instability, environmental catastrophe, impoverishment, they're pushed out of their home countries and they're looking for a place that's safer and more stable. And um, so the digital nomads are very different when we think about global migration, because these are the people that are uh, born into post-industrial nations. They're really the top as far as the global demographics of people that were raised with um, the highest expectations of what their future would hold. And so they, um, you know, so the digital nomads come from these middle class um, families that are in Western nations, they're college educated. The millennial generation in the United States specifically has a 40% a college red rate, um, college degrees earned. And so that's just the highest as far as the previous generation. So they are really set up to um, achieve the best. But when they find out is when they're in their 20s and so on, they just end up in some kind of, um, you know, service industry or something that doesn't fulfill their fantasies of how they thought that their life would turn up. 
And so these are the demographics of my specific participants. In 2017, I joined a few of these digital nomad spaces as far as um, like workshops, conferences. Uh, I went to one uh, 10 day retreat. And while the digital nomad community is portrayed as very kind of white male, they call this like bro mad culture uh, was the term that they used within the community. But these specific events that I went to really targeted women, uh, people of color, and more marginalized kinds of identities. And so my participants are perhaps 75% female. Um, so it's not a representative of the digital nomads, which would be more uh, gender balanced or even more male. But um, I captured their story. So I had 38 participants that I interviewed in depth, and most of them were in their 30s. A few were younger, a few were older. Everyone had a strong passport. Many people had dual passports. There were about two or three people that had um, weaker passports, but they also had dual passports. So someone from Nigeria, someone from Costa Rica also had a UK passport, for example. Um, they mostly spoke English. Um, those who had an or a native language other than English would learn English. Some people spoke multiple languages, but the point was that no one actually uh, learned another language just voluntarily. If they didn't already speak English, then that was the primary language. Mostly white, middle class, college educated, and had moderate student debt. And you know, I'm a, I'm an American, and so you know, in the United States, we just have a student debt crisis. And so, if you have too much student debt, you just really don't have the freedom to travel. Some of the the folks from the UK or from Australia, I know, have student debt that's on a repayment uh, basis to the government, where it's based on their income. But in the United States, regardless of your income, either six months or zero months after your graduation, you must start repaying, even if you have no job at all. So many people uh, in that situation can't travel freely. And so, as was mentioned, this is a, a lifestyle. And so, um, you know, these are people that are think of themselves as very um, adventurous and seeking these kinds of exciting lifestyles, but really they end up staying on the tourist path. They really migrate to where English is uh, a primary um, language so that they don't have to learn other languages. They seek out Western style accommodations. They look for people just like them. And then they're presenting this lifestyle in their social media postings. And I was really struck by just how little um, interest they had in their in their host country because for example we were uh, in Spain during you know some political uh, events such as like the uh, Catalonia vote for independence and a general um, strike and so they were you know uh, hiding away in their co-working spaces and not in the streets or interested in what was happening in those situations and of course they have this very entrepreneurial mindset where they talk all this kind of rhetoric in these terms such as you know passive income it's so easy to make money while you're sleeping um, a lot of these people just um, found out about this lifestyle moved to thailand started going to co-working spaces and from there they didn't have a plan initially but then they start trying to learn how to figure out a way to make money and so drop shipping is this term that is used in these spaces and that's how to set up a website that sells, um, you know, trinkets when people order them shipped directly from the manufacturer. But of course, this is not as easy as it sounds because you have to drive traffic to those websites. So they end up doing these little jobs like web design, Facebook marketing, copywriting, little jobs where they're making $10 here, $20 here. So it's just a very marginal income. And so they might end up making around $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month which you know, just is not sustainable in a place like the United States. But if you can have that kind of money in Thailand, then they can live this kind of leisure, luxury lifestyle that they just cannot have in their home countries. And they also just have the benefit of having a family that if things got rough, their parents could buy them a plane ticket home. They have some kind of personal safety net. 
And so the problems with this is that this is an individual option for larger structural problems. So what we're seeing is that there's a lots of growing inequalities for everyone. And so now it's finally reaching these kinds of developed countries where people that were promised everything, they have the college education, they come from good families, but even they are suffering. And so in the United States, for example, there's just not a, a major city in the nation where you can work a minimum wage job and afford to rent an apartment. And so it's just very, very difficult for people to survive in these, um, you know, so-called rich countries. And so the it, global inequality is one of the drivers that's pushing this. And so, of course, if Americans go to Thailand to live, then they're really displacing and impacting the local people who now have, um, you know, a lot more rentals or oriented towards travelers and tourists rather than the local people and prices may go up and so on and these traveling people can move on to another country but the local people bear that kind of burden uh, we live in just a very um, neoliberal oriented global context which is increasing the price of just absolutely everything and we especially see that now with food and gasoline prices uh, continuing to go up this is a very kind of self-entrepreneurial lifestyle. So the individual becomes the product that they need to sell themselves. And so, um, you know, contrary to this, uh, the four hour work week book that they really sell, this is, these are folks working in the gig economy. They're working in the digital gig economy. And so they have to work more and more and more to make uh, just very little money. So, of course, this is a very capitalist uh, lifestyle. They're anti-tax at the global, at the um, digital nomad workshops they, and conferences. They always have lectures on how to avoid paying taxes. They might actually be, you know, not um, properly working as far as, you know, where they're supposed to be located for whatever jobs they're doing. So there's the issue of that where they might not be um, properly located for a tax uh, situation with their jobs. And it's very individualistic. They're, it's anti-community. They might link up with other digital nomads online, but they're not part of a, a larger community that could really benefit them um, in a mental health kind of way. And so often they, they're very lonely and they're very depressed and they do suffer from a lot of um, mental health um, issues and and a constant lifestyle of traveling is just very difficult and it ends up being this pyramid scheme marketing kind of lifestyle because they're trying to sell other people on the lifestyle because they have so much trouble making money they might have a ebook here's an ebook on how to become a digital nomad so they're trying to sell other people on the lifestyle so if you know you end up giving your um email address to a digital nomad, then you might start to get these spams about advertisements for their, their products or their books or um, what have you. And so they're always, you know, in this selling kind of mode, even with the people, any people that they meet. They always talk about how everyone can be a digital nomad, but that's just not true. Um, you know, if you, if you don't have a strong passport, they really don't, you know, think about these things if you have a strong passport, you don't think about folks who just cannot travel freely, but plenty of folks, um, and there's a, a website that ranks the global passports, and that's based on how many visa-free countries you can travel to. None of the, the nomads were parents that I spoke to, and so certainly people with children or um, who um, perhaps these nomads in the future will have children, and so then that will really limit their mobility. People, you know, especially, you know, in my context of the United States, plenty of folks are working poor. And so just struggling to survive on a daily basis, you just cannot save up enough money to be able to travel internationally. People who are caretakers, location-based workers, those with huge debts uh, embedded in a community, they don't talk about racial minorities, like racial minorities will have to consider issues of, you know, racism and racial issues in the countries that they travel to. 
people with disabilities have a lot of uh, mobility issues with airplanes, lodging, and uh, particular cities that might be more or less accommodating. And then those with criminal records don't have uh, the ability to travel as freely also. And so I think that of this lifestyle, it's just an individual kind of opt out, you know, um, lifestyle. And so what we really need to focus on, it doesn't, it's not contributing to the betterment of society. And so what would be better is to fight against these rising inequalities and global disasters by promoting issues such as workers' rights, unions. You know, in the United States, we have uh, an incredibly low union uh, percentage of around 10%. So we really just do not have unions and workers' rights here. And that's something that if we could strengthen that, then that would help uh, all workers to have more kind of uh, abilities to travel. Social safety nets need to be strengthened. Um, developing real kinds of communities in locations that can provide assistance to each other. Fighting for environmental rights, sustainable travel. I mean, this kind of cheap global travel is really unsustainable and it's doing a lot of environmental damage to the world. So they talk uh, not much about that. And then just having more human connections in established locations. And so within any kind of subculture, there's these hierarchies of who's at the top and the bottom. And within this lifestyle, the, um, the digital nomads who have the most remote work, who have the most flexibility with travel, who can work completely remotely and travel constantly and internationally are the most esteemed. People that travel very fast, you know, hopping from country to country, you might see on their Instagram that they have just a list of flags, you know, so it's this very kind of um, imperialist way of thinking about travel, like you, you conquered 50 countries, but really you only spent three days or so in each one, and instead promote more of a slow travel where someone could rotate between say three locations and really kind of be more connected to communities in those locations. And so that's how I conclude my book in thinking about how we can kind of promote um, the, the better good for all and move away from this kind of individualist um, lifestyle that the digital nomads is really reliant on. And so those are just some of kind of the big points within the book. I think that the demographics of who these are, what their expectations are is really central. But I do want to move on to um, the other speakers, get some other ideas thrown in to the mix, and then some questions so that we can have more kind of a, a dialogue about what, what folks find interesting about this topic. So I'll, I'll pass it on from there. Thank you so much, Beverly, for that very very good speech about what you have seen when doing the research. May I ask uh, Daniel to come up with his comments? Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, your um, presentation, Beverly. Um, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about uh, some of my um responses to the book particularly in light of my own research so just to introduce myself a little bit i'm a professor at the university of waterloo and uh my research is on the digital economy broadly conceived um and i've thought in the past about working cultures in silicon valley and thinking about those cultures through the lens of things like affect feminist theory marxist theory and thinking about how uh, how particular working lifestyles are cultivated and encouraged, in particular when those lifestyles are not um, necessarily uh, the kinds of good jobs that we often think about when we think about what working life might uh, might be like. People who subject themselves to um, extraordinarily long working hours, for example, when they have the privilege to choose other kinds of work and what, what that kind of means. Some of my more recent work has been thinking about working from home during COVID-19. And so in light of that as well, I think this um, this work has been especially interesting for me, thinking about how digital environments are 
changing or transforming or contorting um, the uh, working lives that people have kind of come to expect through the lens of things like the American dream in the US and similar uh, kind of modes of being or belonging or promises that society has kind of made to a particular gen a particular generation with a particular kind of privilege. So I think in, in light of that, to me, it's worth emphasizing um, briefly some of the prominent structural feature features of digital, nomadis digital nomadism in order to think with these insights to see to what extent they might apply as well in more general terms, especially given that people are more aware that maybe not working internationally, but certain, certainly working in a more mobile way is increasingly possible, uh, given the, the push toward working from home during the, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so digital nomads, as uh, Professor uh, Thompson has already talked about, are predominantly white. They're young, English-speaking with powerful passports uh, that allow them access to highly internationalized forms of travel. In general, they don't have children, and many do not aspire to have children, and they variously seek remote work that will allow them to live abroad, claiming in some cases large salaries while enjoying the low cost of living in, most commonly, countries in Southeast Asia, including Thailand and Vietnam. Um, uh, other folks are, as Professor Thompson mentioned, working in a kind of very much gig economy space, right? So um, not everybody has those kinds of jobs. They typically pay no tax in their host country, despite benefiting from services to which they may have access um, and legal and infrastructural systems in place from the kind of very banal physical infrastructure of roads and transit to the legal infrastructure that supports their visa status and passports um, to things like healthcare, healthcare infrastructure if they were to be in an emergency circumstance. Digital nomadism is a lifestyle. Uh, which borrows elements from online influencer culture to create a kind of aestheticization and romanticization of working lives that usually ignores or downplays the privilege, primarily the whiteness and access to powerful passports and intergenerational wealth that the digital nomad holds and the systems of support that their host country has in place for them. And at the same, and at the same time, the digital nomad contributes relatively little to that same host country, right? So in a structural sense, there's a very um, direct form of uh, imperialism, essentially, as, as Professor Thompson noted. One of the elements that's kind of most interesting to me about the digital nomad is that they seem to represent both significant privilege on an increasingly globalized and competitive labor market, and a recognition that the kinds of lives lived by their parents may now be untenable to them in the context of dwindling access to social services and low and stagnant real wage growth in the West uh, since, the, like, since at least the 1970s. The hopes of, for example, good jobs, upward mobility, and home ownership for this generation and those of the younger generation may only be pegged to one's inheritance. And many may, may be forced to choose between whether they want to own a home or to raise, raise children rather than both. So the nomad then, Nom nomadism, this is a word that I'm having a lot of trouble with this morning, nomadism, <laughs> uh, represents a turning away from the unattainability of something like the dwindling American dream in pursuit of something else, without necessarily a full recognition that being able to turn away is itself a sign of privilege, right? Not everybody has the money, the time, the energy, or the resources to be able to invest in a new kind of dream. The precarity of the digital nomad is also a central feature of this lifestyle. This is something like what I've referred to elsewhere as a form of entrepreneurial affect, a structure of feeling generated by a kind of working insecurity that's insulated against any actual risk through personal and financial support networks and through intergenerational wealth. The digital nomad's work may be relatively fragile. It might be temporary. It might be only part-time. It might be contract-based work that lacks basic benefits or it may be impossible to access said benefits when they're working abroad. Yet nomads are insulated against this fragility through their own degrees of privilege. And after all, most could just return home if something went really wrong as well. 
Most other people aren't really able to insulate against these forms of precarity. And so through the, this lens of entrepreneurial affect, we can see that the digital nomad romanticizes their precarious circumstances and suggests it as a lifestyle that others can and should engage in. This is both in terms of the influencer aesthetic that they cultivate online and in terms of the conferences and workshops that uh, nomads run for one another. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, I think I might have viewed this phenomenon as kind of, in some ways, a relatively minor one in terms of the number of people who are actually engaged in it. But I think we can also see, um, based on uh, Professor Hillman's comments at, at the start, that this is a growing trend and growing phenomenon in the US too. Um, but thinking through the, the kind of experiment exacted as a result of the pandemic, which demonstrated quite aptly that working from home or working from anywhere is possible and for many preferable uh, for, a lot of no, for a lot of different kinds of knowledge intensive work. It seems possible that we, we might see some kind of generalization or a limited perhaps generalization of the digital nomad phenomenon. Perhaps again, not to the extent of living a wholly digitally nomadic lifestyle, but a generalized working from home or working from somewhere else that's not the office um, will probably mean that people think differently about their own mobility in the context of working in the years following the pandemic. I think this too is likely to be facilitated by things like declining fertility rates in the global north. The cost of living in relation to real wages is reaching a point where having children, which means usually a relative, relatively sedentary lifestyle, given the requirements to be geographically close to daycares and schools, is increasingly undesirable for younger people. It's simply becoming too expensive to, uh, to have children for those who are in the privileged circumstances of being able to choose whether they have them or not, right? Um, this means that many people will feel less connected to their immediate spatial context, both in terms of the newly available mobility of work for some, and, and the absence of other commitments, uh, and maybe absence of other forms of community in their own spatial context. Research on working from home during the pandemic, um, which is research that I've started to engage in myself, has shown that a great many people, in, in particular parents, but also those in minority positions, want to continue to work from home for at least some or all of their work week. The group most likely to want to return to the office are actually single white men who don't have children. Um, and this is a group that uh, may well see the office as a, as a site of belonging, a site of friendship, a site where they receive valor valor valorization in terms of career advancement. Those who are more likely to be or feel like they might be discriminated against in the office are more likely to want to continue to work from home. Um, and while there was a lot of press earlier in the pandemic about the possibility of kind of mass exodus from cities, the empirical data so far at least hasn't quite borne out this possibility. But I do think that people will be thinking very differently about uh, things like them their own mobility in the context of uh, uh, the years following the pandemic, right? So maybe it will be less in terms of, I want to be a digital nomad and live um, uh, in Southeast Asia and rotate through uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and, and those kinds of countries, but maybe more uh, in terms of thinking about um, where within my own national context do I want to, do I want to be living, right? So I have some some kind of questions um, thinking kind of forward with with Professor Thompson's text. So these aren't questions that I'm posing specifically to uh, to, to you, Beverly, but questions um, that are kind of in my mind as things to think forward with after having read your book and thinking about my own research. And what questions kind of do I have for um, contemporary working society? Uh, so. In light of the experiments with working from home associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, might digital nomadism become a more kind of general phenomenon? And I think we can think about that in a series of different, different ways. What institutional and, and legal consequences might this have for nations most likely to host digital nomads and for international labor markets and the legal infrastructure infrastructures that support them in more general terms? If digital nomadism does become more common, 
how might nations like Thailand and Vietnam, uh, those nations most likely to be destinations for digital nomads, create systems of taxation that allow them to take advantage of digital nomads residency? Is this a possibility? Um, or better yet, how might we encourage a system of responsibility in which digital nomads understand why it might be necessary to pay their share of tax in their resident nations? Thinking back to the idea of digital nomadism as a particular lifestyle, um, upon what conditions is this promise of a particular lifestyle made and foreclosed upon? And how might, it, how might this kind of develop into the future? What might a future of work in which remote and nomadic working is more common uh, look like? So what, what might this future of work look like? How do we ensure that equity is at the, at the center of this system and not just equity in terms of workplace, workplace equity, which is probably the most common way that we think about equity in our everyday lives, but equity in terms of international labor markets and international forms of wealth too. Or will this remain a system only for the relatively privileged in which equity can never really become a major consideration because of the premise of possibility um, of digital momentum is, is precisely an inequitable one based on these legacies of uh, colonialism, legacies of imperialism, in which there is uh, still kind of major international inequality between nations. And then kind of more broadly still, how might we reorganize working circumstances given the transition over the past 30 years to more digital and digitized forms of work? And especially given that in a lot of Western countries, our labor laws and labor, labor provisions are, you know, 70, 80 years old, right? So they very much outdate the digital systems that have been in place for only relatively recently, right? Um, that's kind of all I want to say, apart from just to thank Professor Thompson for her book. Um, I really enjoyed reading uh, what was a fantastic uh, example of qualitative research. So um, I think we can move on to the, the question and answer and discussion now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for your comment, Daniel. I think it's exactly the direction we want to go to, to look on the reorganizing of working conditions. Labor laws are old, you say, 70, 80 years old. And I'm happy to ask Margaret to come up with our discussion now. Please, Margaret, go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you, Felicitas. And thank you, uh, Beverly and Daniel, for really engaging um, discussion that is so wide ranging. It's really hard to know where to begin. But I do want to pick up on the, the discussion in terms of what are the structural implications or what are the structural foundations, if you like, and, and what are the implications if we think of the digital nomad, as Beverly says, as the canary in the coal mine, and, and thinking about Daniel's work, uh, looking at uh, digital, you know, the digital workplace and the future of work. You know, these are so, so significant and it really fits in nicely, Felicitas, with um, earlier webinars and as Beverly mentioned and as you mentioned earlier you know moving away from this kind of analog series of labor conditions which I think Daniel just mentioned you know that many of our labor laws were constructed in a period that is so so distinct and so different and I was thinking of um, Beverly in the introduction to your final chapter about uh, canaries uh, digital nomads being canaries in the coal mine, you talk about um, the reality of the of history is not linear and progress and progressive and pro is not about linear progress as Baudrillard suggests. And so you talk about this notion of a kind of history is in a process of revision. And I feel like we're kind of at that moment. Um, but what I, I wonder about is, is where are we revising toward? And I would like to think that we could be revising toward the more classic kind of Keynesian sense of what is a society. Um, and the interesting thing, though, is that the digital nomads are a very particular kind of individual, as Beverly really well articulated. You know, they are they, they um, are reflecting a kind of neoliberal, entrepreneurial, individual sense of freedom. And I, I think of this in light of um, 
work by theorists like Martha Feynman, you know, who have argued for, for the vulnerability thesis, where she argues at some point in our life, we're all vulnerable. And we need, and the state needs to recognize that. And the state is the most appropriate body to kind of protect us through those phases of vulnerability. But the digital nomads are at that point in their life where they feel as if they are invulnerable, you know, they have no vulnerability. And, and it's almost become invisible to them that they have benefited from the support of their families, of the state. And so I, I wonder sometimes about where is the vulnerability in the digital nomad, you know, and what happens when that vulnerability becomes apparent and they do need the support of a system. Now, did Beverly mentioned they turn to their families, right? That might be their backstop, you know, if they need to get out of a difficult position. Um, and I think Daniel's comments about recognizing how they do benefit from structures of investment social protections, legal protections, you know, heaven forbid, if they should really need to have medical care in an emergency, you know, where is the vulnerability in the digital nomad? And is that a place where we can find perhaps different stories that will uh, adjust the neoliberal uh, entrepreneurial anti-tax persona? And so those are, are things that we can think about in terms of the future of work. And I and it's, it really does encourage us to think about the full life cycle um, of the digital nomad, because we need to find those moments um, where we can reassert the sense of the collective, because I worry that if we can't find a place for the collective to have a meaning uh, for certain communities, like what happens to them? And I think in some ways it already is occurring because Beverly mentioned again, this notion of isolation, depression, and and to me that is a symptom of this of a withdrawal, if you like, from the sense of being part of a collective, of having any this vulnerability, as Martha Feynman, the vulnerability thesis, as as Feynman articulates. And I mean, thinking of what Martha Feynman says with regards to the idea of the vulnerability thesis, she calls in. So she says, I call into focus what we share as human beings and what we should expect of the laws and underlying social structures and relationships that organize society and affect the lives of everyone in society. And in doing this, what she wants to try and do is to re-engage the notion of collective social justice by replacing the neoliberal legal subject, you know, the digital nomad, with the vulnerable legal subject and attending to the state's disregard of human vulnerability in the design of its institutions. So end quote. So, you know, Martha Feynman, I think, gives us something that we can embrace in an effort to try and think toward a more collective social justice agenda. So how do we look at how do we look at digital nomads through the lens of that vulnerable legal subject? And how can it allow us to encourage um, a, a deeper embracing, if you like, of, a, of the value of the collective? And indeed, is that where our revisionist history might be taking us? I mean, I certainly hope so, because, you know, if we continue down the road of the neoliberal individual subject, it seems very dystopic to me, you know, to think of that. And I think you, Beverly, are seeing that come through in those moments when there's a sharing of the the stress and the strain that these young people face and it is a demographic piece it is a life cycle stage we're talking about and Beverly clearly articulated that in terms of who's not in that population and so these are really big questions and Daniel has provided a lot of interesting issues for us to think forward to so with that, I just in, open up the, the floor to responses from Beverly and Dan if they want to talk to each other's questions, but also from the audience. So thank you so much, Felicitas. Thank you so much, Margaret. Maybe to start with, thank you for this comment and um, giving us a chance to think about vulnerability and that we are all vulnerable and we need the state network, which we oversee in that moment of being powerful and traveling in any way. That is a very good hint, I think. But 
What I liked about the book of Beverly is also this uh, metaphor of the canary in the coal mine. And I could imagine that not everybody knows that metaphor. Maybe Beverly can also quickly tell us what it is. Why? How come that you choose that one? Thanks. Uh, as as I understand, the canary in the coal mine, or um, you know, uh, coal miners would take a bird in a cage down into the mine with them, and then if the bird died, that was a sign that they better get out of there. And so it's it's the the most yeah the most vulnerable um life at the forefront and so seeing when that vulnerable life is snuffed out that you you might be next so yeah that that follows uh that concept of the vulnerable but something that really stuck out to me talking to these different folks from my perspective of being an american and talking to folks from the uk and australia is that you know they come from nations with a much much stronger social safety net And so in this global context, then what we can see, especially in this Western context, is that the United States is what you don't want to become. You know, it's, it is the negative dysutopia and that we Americans are living in and that perhaps, um, you know, perhaps even in Canada is in a much, much stronger position. And, and probably they often say, like, we don't want to become, you know, like our Southern mm -hmm. neighbors. Even in just the most recent, you know, gun violence, um, uh, you know, hitting the media, it seems like Canada instilled their own, uh, a, a perhaps another gun law or two uh, in their country. So it's like, you know, they they took the warning, but in the United States, it's just we're, we don't take care of the vulnerable people. And so this is kind of, you know, the global future of Do you follow in the United States pathway? Do you follow in, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, European models, you know, just other national models? But um, I saw that other folks really have uh, a lot better background as far as look, thinking about vulnerable citizens and safety nets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there questions from the audience? I know some of you are also doing research on digital nomads, so maybe you want to comment on this? Hello. Hello. May I jump in? It's Fabiola yes. Mancinelli. Nice to, meet, nice to see nice you again. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to listen to Beverly's talk, where, where of course, I know your work, uh, Beverly, and uh, I, I admire you. We shared this uh, neoliberal critique that you were emphasizing and also I really enjoyed Daniel's and Margaret's comments on the, the white uh, phenomenon. I think um, what I would like just to, um, to, to stress as a point of view is that uh, despite the um, appearance, uh, digital nomads are not a homogeneous population, so there is quite a strong uh, a family uh, family cluster that was uh, described also by Jenny German Maltz in her book about world schooling and extreme uh, parenting. But as this family, as a family form of organization is more oriented to education than uh, like so much on gig work. And of course, the people who are who uh, adventure on this uh, lifestyle as a family are more solid uh, economically because they have more established businesses or professions. So um, I think some of the critics may not totally apply the, the concern about precarization, but I do agree with the large consequences of the phenomenon. And also something that I agree also is this dystopian consequences because as much uh, I was like recently studying visa schemes And I, I, I realized that the e-residency that was uh, um, that was uh, that has been experimented by Estonia is an, as a new kind of residency that does not assume that like physical people migrate to the country is just for capitals. So this is like an unexpected scenario. No, not, uh, not only um, like digital nomads act as neoliberal subjects, but the states and the, the, the country uh, countries respond 
in a neoliberal opportunistic way by creating special categories of visa and implementing exclusionary exclusionary practices of migration. So this is a very interesting uh, downside that I'm sure, you know, we will all, all researchers passionate about this intersection, we will fall into. But, uh, well, there will be a lot to talk about, but I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful presentation for the book and everybody for all the input. So more comments than questions, but I hope that sometime, uh, somehow they can fit into the general discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabiola. I mean, in the title of our webinar was also the term reverse remittances. And I think this is worth thinking about also what Fabiola said. So we see that categories are created, visa categories, new visa categories. And what we see here is some form of migration and mobility which is financed by the place of origin. And there's no money flowing back as far as I can see. Is that right? Beverly. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, definitely for the comment. I mean, there are, are definitely different demographics and some people are quite well off that are traveling in um, family orientation. I, I saw, you know, there's a, a boat where for um, homeschoolers that they, they can get on this boat and travel the world and really have a, a, a the best education. And so I can imagine families kind of pursuing those um, things and Estonia with their e visa for the company also the Caribbean nations were trying to have longer term like one year visas to capitalize on these remote work but yeah for the the nomads taking their family money and then traveling but not sending the money back home nor contributing to their host country But did you have a chance also to speak to the people in the place of arrival? So experts there, did they hope that people would spend their money there? Some yeah, sort I, of gentrification yeah. we might see? Right, yeah, definitely I'm in the host countries, folks reliant on the tourism economy would hope that that kind of trickles down. But we see this tourism model in the Caribbean where you have your um, all-inclusive resort, you know, so someone might go to the Caribbean and only have all their meals, all their drinks, everything inside the resort. But right outside the resort, you see the local people trying to sell their little handmade trinkets and then the hotel making sure that those people are at a distance and to push them away. And so I think that's really symbolic of this kind of um, you know, tourism model where these these folks are separated. Could I just ask there, Beverly? I mean, there's so much overlap then with the issues around tourism. And in your final chapter, you talk about the kind of critical, almost reflexive engagement that many of the digital nomads you spoke to about their practice of tourism. And so you talk about slow tourism and regenerative tourism. So is it possible that there is a sort of um, an awakening to the kinds of conditions that Felicitas is talking about, where this the real kind of reverse remittances might actually occur if those digital nomads change their philosophy on movement, on mobility? I definitely um, there could be some segments that are more towards slow tourism. And I did meet at least one person who had learned Spanish and she moved to Guatemala. So she's more of this expat kind of category. And so people that really do embed themselves in the local community. But I don't see that they would be making more money where they're in a host country to the point where they could be sending money back home. And they're just... Like Daniel said, in um, these these are people that are never going to achieve what their parents achieved, and so they're never going to be giving money back to their parents and to their family because this is the downward mobile generation, and this is just I mean as a as a sociologist and as an American sociologist, I just have a totally disutopian perspective of, of how bad things can go because, I mean, we saw with the pandemic, like the United States was just the worst in the world. And often American exceptionalism is being the worst in the world and just belligerently so, you know, with the gun violence example and with just every example, you see how the Republicans just 
you know, do not want to cooperate in into contributing to any kind of social safety net. And so hopefully West, other Western countries do not follow our example because, I mean, the poverty in the United States, we really need to quit saying the United States is the richest country in the world. We should say that, you know, we have the highest rates of poverty of any industrialized nation, and it's just really crushing. Thank you.